in the game of life, Major Scott Smiley doesn't play by the rules. Scotty's climbed Mount Rainier, gone surfing, skydived, written a book, and has a wife and three children in Spokane, Washington. He has been blind for 10 years. The Ironman is a 2.4 mile swim, 112 mile bike, and a 26.2 mile run or a marathon. I'm going to be doing the Coeur d'Alene Ironman this year, 2015. Some people ask me why. I don't know if I can give an honest answer. I'll be conducting the Ironman a little different way. Um, I'm blind. I've been blind for a little over 10 years, and so I need a partner for every part of the race. My partner, Andy Cooper, who's my brother-in-law, is the best partner in the world. Around the time that we met, I was doing my Ironman in 2012. So we got to talking about that, and I think we were both kind of impressed by each other. And then I don't know exactly how the Ironman came to be, other than I think once the seed was planted, neither one of us was gonna say no to the other. Him and Scotty were just sitting around talking, and Andy said, you know, I'll never do an Ironman, but I guess I would do one with you, Scotty. <laughs> and so they sort of, They've done triathlons together and Andy's just loved being active and doing things with Scotty. He's had a great time doing it and I decided to give it a try. For me, it's about exercise, constantly putting myself forward and just really challenging myself in ways in which I may not have thought I could have. Scott Smiley will be out there with you on Sunday when you see him. Cheer him on. We used to make pancakes together, didn't we, Grady? Because you do the reading, I do the, the teaching, and then boom. Scotty's home in Spokane is only a 50-minute drive from the waters of Lake Coeur d'Alene, the starting point of the Ironman race. When I first heard from Nicole about Scotty's story, I was probably like a lot of people who have not spent much time around a blind person and went right to all the normal stereotypes. Look, there comes one of them now. The stick and, and I'll admit, you know, a lot more helpless than he really is. Hey, Graham. Are you guys being safe? He's probably made it easier for his family, his wife, and everybody that knows him to quote unquote cope with his blindness. And give me a smile. It makes us, it makes our life easier. We don't hurt as much mm -hmm. because he is strong. Where's your car? A little bit further down, Scotty. Not that one. Seat open. Seat's open. You're good. Scotty has that ability where, you know, you don't treat him like somebody who is handicapped. You don't treat him as somebody that cannot see. You, he feels so much that he probably sees better than we do. Wait, boy, Dad. What, son? What, Dad? I want you to wave as you go bye bye. Daddy waving at you. Say bye, Daddy. Bye, Dad. Aww. <laughs> First day of misery, man. How you feeling? Good. Me too. What's that? A little after eight. We had laid everything out pretty carefully the night before. Uh, the morning was a bit of a scramble, like always, because. There's always last minute adjust adjustments to the air pressure in the tires and the nutrition on the bike. At no point did I feel terribly rushed, but we didn't have a lot of extra time in the morning. I got it, Scotty. Are you sure? Let's go get marked up. 
No, the temperature's definitely gonna be a big one. Another 30 degrees added on, around 105 today is a high. About the exact time that we'll be making the transition from the bike to the run, so. Not to say it's a good time to be entering at 100 degrees, but it is what it is. Just gotta stay hydrated and not push our bodies to the max to where uh, they begin to fail, especially mentally. It will be gut-wrenching. Um, he's an athlete, he's been in the pool, he went to the Army Divers School, which is one of the most rigorous. Ranger School is no walk in the park, the toughest school that we have. And um, so he's gonna fall back on some of that training, that experience. How are you guys feeling? Good. The camera's good. Oh, okay. I saw your hands and I got like, what the heck? Like, so we need to get down there. Okay, okay. A natural athlete and having completed military diving school, Scotty is a strong asset in the water. They have until 10.35 p.m. to finish the race. In order to earn the Iron Man title, Scotty contends with residual effects from battle. See the IED. There's a lot that I don't remember that day. Um, there's spotty remembrances of you know me heading out the gate, me um, you know talking to my commander, um, and then you know brief very, we're talking seconds, memories of, of the man in the vehicle. Soldiers receive missions to accomplish a task for a given purpose. They understand what needs to be done. The who, what, where, when, why comes in the mission statement. And a big part of it is how does it fit into the bigger picture? And so upon receipt of mission analysis begins and that causes a process where soldiers figure out how they're gonna go forth and execute what they're expected to do. The, the back end of the car was lower than the front had a single man in the driver's seat, his head was buzzed, his face was buzzed, had like a gray or you know, shirt down to his wrist in a silver opal, opal of the cars that almost everyone else drives. But just the suspiciousness, you know, the back end being lower, um, meant something was wrong. You can't just shoot someone over there because you're scared or something looks wrong. They actually, you have to have full knowledge that they have a weapon. There was a lot of young men and women over there. And I, I really thought, what were the chances that my son would be one that was injured or worse yet killed? So I decided to court on him off and I parked my striker vehicle just 30 yards to his south. You know, I was facing east, he was facing west on the same road and then yelled at him to get out of his vehicle and you heard about people being injured and killed all the time, but you just somehow had, had hope, faith that they wouldn't, that they would escape. He looked over his left shoulder at me, raised his hands up, and then I responded in the same manner. He reacted in the same manner, and then he let his foot off the brake, and then that's when I raised my M4 up to my shoulder, shot two rounds in front of his vehicle, and then he disintegrated his car. And um, I woke up about a week and a half later in Walter Reed Army Medical Center. The shrapnel pierced his left eye. Shrapnel went through it and then entered my brain. Um, and then a piece of shrapnel went in my right eye also. I first learned, you know, we don't know if he's going to live. Then I learned we removed his eye and we're going to have to remove his second eye. And at that point, I couldn't imagine life for him being fulfilled. So my brain was hit. That, I was paralyzed the right side of my body. Oh, um, you were? Yeah. So. The VA and Army said I have 10% loss in muscle strength on the right side of my body. Uh -huh. He's kind of asymmetrical right now because of his paralysis. Um, his right side of musculature throughout his body really is, 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 is shrunken or what we call atrophy compared to his left. See how much this tibia is a lot oh, longer yeah. than that one. Huh. So I'm, I'm surprised that you did have more of a change with running yeah. since there is such an obvious leg length discrepancy. Mm -hmm. His uh, right leg is about three quarters of an inch shorter than the left. And um, with that big of a, of a leg length discrepancy, you can see that someone, as they fatigue during an endurance event, um, 
those problems are just going to be compounded by that leg length discrepancy. I think that his leg length difference and his weakness on his right side from paralysis definitely have effect upon one another. If you're not as symmetrical as you could be, that just sets up more chances for problems down the road, especially with overuse and, and lots and lots of training and lots and lots of miles. So um, yeah, that's another, uh, I guess you could say that's another you know, card in the deck stacked against it. Conditions in the morning were ideal for the swim with a comfortable water temperature and blue skies. I think for me, there's, there's an advantage to not being able to see how far I had to go. Um, my wife, Tiffany, when she saw the, how long the swim is, she was just like, it was, it was scary. And she's like, and my wife's a, a pretty good swimmer. And she said she felt she would grab the first buoy 30, 30 <laughs> yards off the shore and just, hung on for dear life. I remember stepping down onto that beach and looking at how far the swim is, like realistically seeing it was overwhelming for me. And I thought to myself, if this was me, I would see that and quit. <laughs> it looked so daunting. But then I thought of Scotty and I'm like, no, for Scotty, this is just laps in the pool. When I think of Scotty, I always think of a hard worker, very dedicated, determined, perseverance, all those awesome traits he, um, he has. You know, back in school, his um, academics, he was always studying, always working hard to do his best. And sports, same thing. Hey, Scotty. Okay. Scotty played as a sophomore at, at Pasco High School, and that, that didn't happen very often back in those days. Uh, just a great kid, great work ethic. He was just a determined kid, very focused. Uh, we, we were definitely trying to develop leadership, and, and Scotty fit right in there. He, uh, he was resolved to do the very best that he could possibly do, no matter what it took. But it's truly the fact that you're working for something bigger and better than yourself. That if you lose on the mat, it's not the coach's fault, it's not your team's fault, it's your fault. And so it truly teaches you personal responsibility and teaches you to work harder than you ever thought you could before. Scotty and Andy completed the swim in an hour and 25 minutes, showing little signs of fatigue. They were greeted by the cheers and encouragement of spectators and family, including Scotty's wife, Tiffany, and their sons. It's hard uh, to conduct a lot of the training that we've done um, it, it, you know, sometimes it's the motivation just to get on the treadmill, to get out to the road, to get on the bicycle, to, or to get on the spin bike, or to get to the pool. And, and for me, it, I have a luxury, I have a partner that I talk to. I think Andy gets annoyed because I am a little kid in the car. How much further are we there yet? I point Scotty in the right direction, and he just takes off. So I've had other swimmers in a crowd try to get right on Scotty's feet, and I've had to kind of steal him back, say, no, <laughs> this is my draft. Those are my feet. I can't lose those feet, because if I do, he's just going to keep on swimming. Same goes for the tandem. He directs me to the tandem. We get on the tandem and then he steers, uh, brakes, shifts gears, directs me if we're getting water. Not a whole lot to it. It's more work, I've decided. It's harder and slower to cover the same distance on a tandem than it would be on my own bike. And then obviously on the run, He's at my same eyes, in which I run next to him and he tells me left, right.
We just carry a little piece of surgical tubing with a loop on either end and I try to match him stride for stride so that our arms are swinging in sync. We motivate each other, but for me, I wouldn't be able to do the race without him. jersey's dripping wet and you're cool and you're excited and you're amped up and we did just take off I don't think either one of us felt our legs for the first what is it about 14 miles of this smaller loop the sun was still low there was still some shade out there the temperature was only 90 <laughs> the Coeur d'Alene on June 28th was greeted by discouraging forecasts the hottest anyone had seen in almost a hundred years. Well, the weekend is here and here comes the heat. Tom Sherry now in the Weather Center with more on that. Boy, you know, normally when it's this hot, we tell you to stay inside, try to get into some air conditioning, don't physically exert yourself, and look at the weekend we've got for events. Iron Man over in Coeur d'Alene, and of course Hoop Fest in downtown Spokane with record-breaking temperatures on the way. Triple-digit temperatures both Saturday and Sunday in Spokane and Coeur d'Alene. Uh, so, wow, you have really got to take care of yourself. The heat for the Iron Man this uh, this upcoming Ironman this weekend is going to be a, a big concerning factor. It's going to make the, the race much more dangerous for the athletes. Someone that hasn't acclimated at least for a week or two prior to this event are really exposing themselves to hazards that they, they're not aware of. And before you know it, you're on the ground trying to recover and, and you need medical attention at that point. My only concern is if someone does die this weekend, that would be, you know, I mean, that is a real possibility of, of someone, someone dying uh, doing an event like this. And it's, it's not the elite athletes that are gonna be the issue. It'll be someone like Scotty's, um, Scotty's age, his fitness level, that are trying to do Ironman for the first time if they, you know, don't have a good um, system for saying, okay, I've had enough, I'm done. If they aren't able to do that, that could put them in a potentially dangerous uh, scenario. second loop we knew an aid station was coming up we took what little water we had left and poured it over ourselves which was only mildly refreshing because the water is now 100 degrees by the time we reached the next aid station we were we were dried up I mean I was I was really in need of some more water at that point and then they were all out <laughs> and I wasn't sure you know if we were going to be able to go another 10 miles without water you can see that aid station coming up, up the hill, and you're dying. And you're like, oh my gosh, there's water, there's Gatorade. You get up there and there wasn't any water, and it was kind of a panicky feeling, almost like I'm not gonna make it. Like, I need this, like, badly. It's a 6% grade uphill, about three miles long, on a tandem, in which you were just, our legs are just pumping, pumping, pumping and you're just waiting for that rest station waiting for the ice to be poured down my back like down my front over my head the water to hit my face like it was gonna be so refreshing and to hear we're all out of ice we have no water and all we have is more Gatorade 
was just crushing. The was crushing. He said there's been, as I recall, her, her terms to us, or at least my wife's term to me, was he's got sight impairment. I knew, I knew it was not good with his eyes or they wouldn't have even mentioned it. I was woken out of bed at 2 a.m. to a phone call, ultimately thinking, oh, this is Scotty, but it happened to be someone else's voice on the other line telling me, you know, Scotty's hurt really bad. And the gentleman on the other end of the line just started sobbing on the phone to me and that's when obviously my world froze. And it was maybe 7 a.m. and that is way too early for anybody to be calling a college student. And so I knew instantly um, something was wrong. And everybody around me could tell something wasn't right. Um, yeah, so that's, that's when it hit me. It was very hard to see him for the first time. He, I think the only thing that I recognized was the chin, his chin. Everything, he was so bloated and so, had so many tubes coming out of him everywhere. Um, that was hard, but uh, I think harder than that was seeing another son looking out the window that was totally broken. It was, um, it was more just the the seriousness was, you know, when we actually realized, okay, he's he could die. You know, it, it, it changed from from okay, how about his, are his injuries to you know, how, am I gonna see my brother again? I can say there was times that I felt my life was taken away because I did not have the ability to see, because I was half paralyzed, because my life had changed so drastically, I didn't know what I was gonna do. I didn't know how to take care of myself, nor my, my wife. People would say things to me that I still obviously remember, like, oh, he, he's gonna hear the birds chirp, and I'm like, no, that's not Scotty. That's not how he's gonna live his life. That's not gonna work. Um, so, it, it was hard. I mean, I remember thinking, like, it's over. We're not going to do anything. It's not going to be a fulfilling, happy life. It's not going to be good. At this point in the day, the sun had reached its peak. As Scotty and Andy struggled on, heat exhaustion rendered several hundred athletes incapable of completing the Ironman. Wow. Keep going, Andy. 
moving. We're moving. We're going to holy water. Way to tie it back. Let's go, See you guys I'm always striving, fighting, wanting something more out of life. I fought for it for Scotty. I wanted him to live more, and that was sort of my Iron Man. Tiffany is a very strong-willed person. Um, does not get, did not get when she was younger, very emotional about anything. Or like, of course. Um, God designed Tiffany for Scotty because she's, uh, she's also not afraid of a challenge. Tiffany is one of my role models in life and she is strong-willed and she's, she's awesome. I would describe her as spunky and happy. Here I'm crying, she's happy. Um, she just, she endures. She's a, a godly example of what a wife should be. Oh, that's great. I miss seeing uh, my wife's face. Just, she's drop dead gorgeous, just a wonderful woman uh, to look at. And it's hard just not being able to see see her, see her smile, see her cry, see her emotions, because I don't know where she's at and, and you know, with her, with her mind, with her emotions. Um, so it, it, it's transformed our relationship to, to be mu that much more communicative. I've always believed that two is greater than one if, if two can act as one. Well, Tiffany and, and Scotty have acted as one in a very, very beautiful manner before and after. As the 10.36 p.m. cutoff quickly approached, Scotty and Andy were still miles from the end. As the sun was starting to set and the temperatures were subsiding, Scotty and Andy were reaching their physical limits. The last leg of the marathon was in sight, but the finish couldn't feel further away. The hardest part for me was seeing him at his lowest of lows. I mean, I, I remember cheering for him and noticing his face didn't change. He didn't even make a gesture or acknowledge that I had said something. Good job, you guys. Good job. Scotty. Scotty. How are you? I'm alive. Almost done? Almost. Good for you. Almost. Congratulations. Oh, I'm so sad. I, uh, I don't normally lose everything I had, but I did do that at 17. Oh, yeah. That's a good wall. So bad. It's pretty awesome. Oh, cool. Felt good afterwards. <laughs> I almost did that. Today. Seeing what you've done from afar, and I'm proud of what you've done. You, well, you've had a lot of impacts, whether whether you realize it or not. Every one of us who kind of steps back into the fight. Yeah. You know, whatever form that but takes, it inspires others. So, sure. great work. I do appreciate you too. Over. This is pretty impressive no. that you're pulling this thing off. I just told him, you know, you're not here for yourself. I'm like, the pain is not about you. It's about everyone else that can't be here. It's about those people who are still struggling out there. You're doing this for so much more than yourself. And it's not just that you're struggling, Scotty. This is for a far greater cause. Greedy, greedy, they're coming.
The winner of the race, Andy Potts, finished at 1.50 p.m., using only half of the race time allotted to athletes. For Scotty and Andy, it became apparent that their will to keep moving was not going to be what stopped them. It was a race against the clock to avoid being disqualified by the 17-hour time limit. As they set out for the second half of their marathon, only three hours and five minutes remained. Even the smallest mishap, like a muscle cramp, long water break, or even a broken shoelace, could mean the difference between going home with the Iron Man title or going home empty-handed. Yeah, yeah. Just saying they like to flip, like Andy wasn't doing well on the way out, and then now Scotty's not, and Andy feels great. I just don't think he's eaten that much. He didn't really talk to us, but he's taking salt and pepper. you always want to get moving like complete this mission no later than this time and you know whether the enemy's tracking you or whatever there's always a mission and for me I knew at least in the back of my mind I believe that if we didn't keep a certain pace or at the time elapsed of us just sitting at a rest station it's time that's working against us. left them, you know, two miles or so to go in the Ironman race, and I thought, in my heart, they got it. Thank you, Jesus, they got it, they're going to do this, and then I took off on the bike, and I'm like, oh gosh, looking at my watch, I'm like, that was kind of a long ways on my bike, There's still a chance, this can be taken, like, something can happen, they cannot make it still. By no means was I trying to skirt in on the last last second I was doing everything I could just to, to stay alive to keep my body temperature down but to keep moving at the fastest pace that I could and there was definitely certain times in which especially the first 13 of the marathon um, I knew if I did stop there'd be a huge chance I wouldn't get back up hello again Tiffany how are you Scotty Sir. Ken Farmer, Major General Farmer, how you doing? Good, sir. Good, good. How's everything going? Excellent. You guys are treating me well. Well, that's good to hear. I am sure that Scotty went through many dark moments. But I'm also sure that he can see right now. And so God gave him his vision of purpose again. Maybe not the physical vision, but probably a vision that's more important because there are many people who can see who do not know purpose. Scotty can see his purpose. And with that, uh, let me ask, I think uh, Brother Neil, is, uh, who's up here from the Q course, is going to read the citation. Yes, sir. Attention to orders. The President of the United States of America has awarded the Purple Heart, established by General George Washington at Newburgh, New York, August 7th, 1782, to First Lieutenant Scotty Michael Smiley, United States Army, for wounds received in action on 6 April 2005, given under my hand in the city of Washington this day, 11th of April 2005. I think it gives people Science hope. I mean, it's no lie that we all struggle. It's no lie that this world is full of negative things. I feel like people are wanting something more for themselves, for this country, for this world. 
And maybe in some small way, Scotty is a beacon of light. Scotty is a way that they can see goodness out of suffering. That's what it began to mean to me, is that we don't give up on life. We don't give up on what struggles or, or trials may be facing us. When God meets us and says, good job, good and faithful servant, your race is complete. There's a reality of living life while at the same time not selling yourself short. That you know you should be able to do anything you want to do if you set your mind to it. You can reach goals and ambitions and, and things in which many may think you can't, but if you've given up on yourself, you're the first person to prove that you can't do it. So for me, it's something in which I don't want to do is to give up on life. Who I am is not someone to give up.